So, enough of me. That's about that's it for a bit. That's okay. I've done badly with time, I know, but that's life in general, isn't it, Terry? Um, what I would say um, is we're going to hear we're going to hear a, a, a really really interesting um, talk now from Professor Jeremy Dawson. Um, so Jeremy's a professor of health management at the University of Sheffield. I gather he also should support Sheffield Wednesday. I don't know what that means. <laughs> but I know that Byron supports that as well. <laughs> um, and and um, Jeremy's research really focuses on a number of key areas really about team working, HR management work in the NHS really. Um, but also he's done, he's done a lot of work on the work regarding group safety, group dynamics and how we make that work. And when we were curating today we thought who are the right people that we think can give us a sense of how we're going to work together going forward and eight CCGs coming together with a big group, how do you do it? So, so I'm really, really keen to hear what Jeremy's going to say. So, Enough from me, let's hand over to Jeremy um, and let's show our appreciation for Jeremy. Okay, sorry, I wasn't expecting you not to be able to hear myself. <laughs> so, uh, thank you very much, Adam, and um, it's a delight to be with you all this morning, a real privilege um, to speak to you. Um, how are we all doing this morning? Good. Excellent. I have to admit that when we first started planning about uh, this event some weeks or months ago, I was envisaging the journey down from Sheffield to Sussex in, on a December morning and thinking I'm going to be battling the snow, ice, which uh, obviously have done at this time of year um, several times in the past. Fortunately, it's very mild at the moment. Um, so I, I'm delighted to see so many of you here today. Um, and I'm, it's, it is really a privilege to talk to you about what we, uh, as a research team, have done over the last few years um, to give you some idea of the evidence we've gathered and what it means for the NHS, because actually it's what you do as commissioners, as managers, as providers, that really, really makes this matter. Um, it's all very well for us um, sitting in research departments and, and asking intellectual, semi-intellectual questions about what actually happens, but unless it really comes back to you and you can use this to uh, improve and, and really develop what you do as managers, then it's not really worth anything. So it's, it's wonderful to be able to talk to you today. Um, as Adam mentioned, we're talking about uh, leadership throughout the course of the day, but that's not really all of it. Um, and so the last part of my talk this morning, I'm going to um, talk a bit about leadership specifically and what leaders might do. But in order to get there, I need to talk to you about a whole range of evidence that we've gathered um, about how working in organisations, working in NHS organisations, links with outcomes for staff and outcomes for patients. Um, I ought to say, by the way, my background is not uh, in, uh, in the NHS. I've never worked directly in the NHS. I'm not a clinician. Um, I'm actually by background a statistician. Um, so I value data very highly. Um, and you'll probably recognise that as I go through my talk. Um, uh, there may be some things that make less sense to you because uh, I'm going to throw a lot of numbers at you. Um, hopefully I'll try and do it in a way that makes it easy for you to, to understand, but if not, there's an opportunity to ask questions later on in the morning. Um, so, talking of data, um, three people up on screen here. Uh, I'm sure that most of you will recognise one or two of them. Um, so, on the left, obviously, we have Florence Nightingale. Um, who is, as a statistician, a real hero of mine. Um, she was the first um, female member of the Royal Statistical Society. She used data, she recognised the importance of data in trying to work out how to improve the care that can be delivered to patients. Um, and um, what she did 
well over 100 years ago, is still, by today's standards, <coughs> relatively um, adventurous and relatively in innovative. Um, <coughs> likewise, Mary Seacole in the middle um, didn't use data in quite the same way, but recognised, in the same way that Florence Nightingale did, that link between what staff do, how organisations and services are delivered, and what patients experience. And the fact that um, 100, 150 years later, we're still having to get that message across shows that this is a big, big issue. How many of you recognise the chap on the right? Anyone know who he is? His name is Kenneth Schwartz. Um, you may recognise uh, the name Schwartz. Um, how many of you here have been to a Schwartz round? Okay, a few of you. Um, how many of you work in organisations where they run Schwartz rounds? No? Okay, well, in which case I will say a bit more about that later in the talk. But Kenneth Schwartz, just to give you some background here, he was, um, he was a lawyer. He was a lung cancer patient, lung cancer patient um, in Boston, Massachusetts in the 1990s. Um, and he <coughs> was for quite a while and recognised while he was there that the care that was delivered to him varied significantly from day to day, even when delivered by the same doctors and nurses. What one nurse on one particular day might do, um, which would be really positive, the next day might be much more negative. And he was intelligent enough to realise that this wasn't because that particular nurse didn't want to provide good quality care, but because there were other things that were preventing them from doing so, whether it was other work pressure, whether it was the stress of a particular situation which had got to them, uh, whether they distracted by um, concerns elsewhere. And this was something that was common to all sorts of different caregivers. Um, but he realised that in order to help healthcare staff deal with the pressures they face, and sometimes these are really, really huge pressures, they needed support. And so Schwartz Rounds um, were set up in his, uh, in his name, basically via a legacy that he left, the Schwartz Centre, which is based in Boston, uh, Massachusetts, is um, in charge of trying to spread these rounds. And what happens in the Schwartz round is um, different people get together, um, usually somewhere between anywhere, anywhere between about 20 and 150, um, they happen about once a month, and the, uh, there are, there's a panel of usually three or four people who would each deliver their perspective on a difficult situation. Not a clinical difficulty, but either a, a particularly difficult patient or one which creates um, particularly emotional difficulties. Sometimes it's four different perspectives on the same patient. Sometimes it's four linked stories about similar situations. And these are facilitated giving other people present the opportunity to discuss what's happened, discuss their own experiences of similar events, and lift some of the um, pressure which put, is put on them. By discussing this, enables them to become more in touch with their actual feelings. They become compassionate towards not only the patients, but towards their colleagues and towards themselves. I'm so glad that Adam mentioned having to be compassionate towards yourself. Um, because it is really uh, at the heart of what we can do, what you can do, uh, in order to help improve the lot of your colleagues and your patients. So I'll say a little bit more about what we discovered with Schwartz Rounds a little bit later, but it's worth, in the first instance, just talking about how staff experience and patient experience is related. It won't come to anyone here a surprise that there is a link between staff experience and patient experience. But the nature of that link is not always necessarily as you might expect. 
Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about uh, some work I, uh, I did uh, last year, uh, where we looked at the staff survey in the NHS, linked this with the patient survey, um, and these are all the different areas that we concentrated on and seeing which things were linked most to what. Well, in terms of patient experience, what we found is, although there were some differences between organisations there, um, essentially some organisations were better generally in terms of patient satisfaction than others. But in terms of staff experience, there's a whole lot of different areas where some organisations did better, some organisations did worse. So the question for us was, which of the areas of staff experience are those which most predict high quality patient experience? So to just take a look for a, a few seconds at all the different um, areas of staff experience here and have a think what you would expect to be the most linked to patient experience. This is one of those situations where if it was a smaller group, I'd start asking you what you think. But I realise if we start doing that here and now, it might lead to um, a very long session indeed. So I'll tell you. It probably won't surprise many people to know that the, the single biggest factor predicting patient experience is work pressure. Staff who are under more work pressure tends to um, lead to patients who experience poorer quality of care, are less satisfied with quality of care. These things are not hidden from patients. And that to us wasn't a great surprise. It tallies with so much research that's been done in the past. But the next few were slightly more surprising. Perhaps they shouldn't have been surprising. It certainly wasn't a surprise that they were linked, but the fact that they were linked more than certain other factors, we might have expected things like communication, team working, to be really important linked to um, patient satisfaction, and they were linked. But more so than that, the next two were the perceptions that staff had of equal opportunities in their organisation, and the experience of discrimination. So where more staff perceived that there were uh, equal opportunities given for career progression and promotion, regardless of their background, patients rated their care better. And almost as significant as that, where more staff said they experienced discrimination, either from colleagues or their organisation, or from patients, then patients rated their care worse. And this was patient care rated the following year, so it's, it's not that they're just reacting to um, the care that they were given. And the fact that these are two things are right there um, as amongst the three most important factors predicting patient experience means that we need to really focus on this. We need to really make sure that um, we are treating staff in as positive way as possible, so that the mechanisms behind this, the reason that staff maybe don't do what they should be doing or aren't motivated or aren't well enough to deliver the care that they should be delivering, or even if it's just patients recognising, as Kenneth Schwartz did, that things aren't right. This is not good for anyone. And so I will say a little bit more later about how we can deal with this explicitly. Um, but one of the key factors that we need to take into account here is staff engagement. Now staff engagement won't be a new topic to anyone here. It's been part of the NHS landscape uh, conversation for at least 10 years. It's been measured in the NHS staff survey for the last 10 years. Um, However, despite that, it's not, still not as well understood by all as uh, perhaps it should be. And part of the reason for that is there is no clear, consistent definition for it. Um, what I like to 
uh, use rather than a strict definition is this description given in the NHS employers um, staff engagement toolkit. The description says that engaged staff think and act in a positive way about the work they do, the people they work with, and the organisation that they work in. Now that, I think, needs a little bit of unpacking. Because there's at least three different elements to that which we need to um, consider. The first thing is it's about the positivity. The positive way is common to all elements of this. If there is a negative culture in an organisation, this transmits itself to pretty much everything, including patients, as we've seen. But it's about not only what people do or what people think, but both together. It's how they think and act. There is a link between the two. You can't expect people to think um, or, or to have a horrible experience at work, but then act in a positive way towards patients. It doesn't work like that. Um, but then there are three different elements of how people are thinking and acting, in what context. So it's about the work they do, which is about the, their core job, their relationship with patients. How they work with other people, people in their team, other people in different parts of the organisation, so they're working as colleagues, but also represent their organisation. Do they speak positively about the organisation? Can they promote it in a helpful way? And these three different elements are captured within the NHS staff survey uh, measure of engagement, uh, in that there's uh, part of it about what's referred to as motivation, which is the extent to which people really are engaged with their core job. Um, involvement, where pe how people interact with others in their organisation, how they can make a difference to those around them. And advocacy, the extent to which patient, sorry, to which staff will recommend their organisation as a place to work or as a place to receive treatment. Now, I know many of you come from commissioning organisations. Um, Patients wouldn't necessarily receive treatment directly in the organisations. And it's, it's true to say that a lot of what I'm saying today includes evidence from all sectors of the NHS. There's quite a few bits, uh, including what I already presented, relating to uh, staff experience, which come predominantly from the acute sector. Um, now, the main reason for that is because actually the the amount of data and the quality of data that comes from that sector is that much stronger, um, which enables us to uh, draw much firmer conclusions there. But actually what we've seen, where we have got data from other parts of the NHS, is it works in exactly the same way, or pretty much the same way, in all different NHS sectors. Um, so don't be distracted by the fact that I might talk about some uh, outcomes which are unique to acute trusts, um, of course, even for those commissioners amongst you, that's important anyway. Um, but all of the uh, underlying truths in what I'm saying would apply to uh, all sectors of the NHS as far as we can tell. So, um, why is engagement important? Well, um, to give one example of this, uh, this is showing how engagement is linked to patient mortality in acute trusts. What we see is that in trusts which have higher levels of engagement of their staff, and this applies whether we're talking about overall engagement or any of the three different elements, motivation, involvement or advocacy, we see that there is lower patient mortality using the standardised measure. Now there's all kinds of reasons why this might be. It's not necessarily a direct causal relationship. There are all sorts of other factors, including, of course, leadership, um, that will contribute to this. But the evidence is incontrovertible. What we see is in trusts with a, a high level of uh, engagement, and by high level, what I'm talking about is one standard deviation above the norm. If that doesn't mean anything to you, then it's something that would be probably, probably just about in the top 20% of trusts compared with an average trust, one which is straight down the middle, um, the mortality levels are about 2.4% lower. 
Think about that for a minute. <coughs> What's mortality in a typical acute trust in a given year? How many people dying is that? This is not a trivial finding. This is not something that we can say, oh, well, it's just a small effect. If we're talking about um, this many people dying, whether or not we can attribute it directly to specific engagement initiatives, it's something we need to take, sit up and take notice of. But if that argument isn't strong enough, something that often uh, works uh, in a different way to, to focus the, um, the thoughts of leaders in the NHS, I found it is, is what does it mean for the bottom line? What does it mean for the, the bank balance? And one thing we looked at last year is the extent to which engagement is linked to um, staff absenteeism. The fact that there's a link between engagement and absenteeism probably isn't a surprise. But then, what does that mean for what it costs a trust in terms of bank and agency staff? Well, again, a one standard deviation increase in engagement on a, in an average size trust is associated with about 2,000 fewer sick days a year. So again, quite a significant amount. And when we look at the spend on agency and bank staff, that is associated with about £1.7 million a year in one trust one average size trust. Multiply that across all the provider organisations in your patch, you're missing quite a big amount there. Um, so, we've got two different strands here. We've got the actual patient health outcomes, we've got um, financial outcomes for organisations. Between these two, we really need to um, think about what we can do to make this better. So how can we get that engagement up um, so we can lead to better patient care but also give ourselves more um, freedom with our resources to do what we should be doing. So one of the key things to talk about is a way to improve engagement and um, uh, as well as to other outcomes is team working. Uh, now you may have noticed uh, when I showed the, the results earlier, team working came in as one of the more important elements of staff uh, experience in predicting patient satisfaction, albeit not the most important. What we have found across a whole stream of work is that it is constantly an important factor. And in terms of engagement, what we have looked at is in what situations are staff more likely to be engaged. There are different questions about team working in the NHS staff survey. They've changed a bit in recent years, um, but until a few years ago, there were four questions um, that were asked as yes, no questions. So first of all, do you work in a team? Well, well over 90% of staff in the NHS say that they work in a team. Um, that's probably not a great surprise. Most of us think of working in a team, whether or not, when we start to break it down, it's a proper team. But there are three characteristics of team working that have been shown to be really critical. They're not the only three, but they're the three most critical. Um, and these are about whether the team has clear objectives, whether staff have to work closely with other team members or interdependently, to achieve those objectives and whether the team um, meets frequently to discuss its effectiveness and how it can be improved. So these three questions were also asked in the staff survey. The number of people who said that they worked on the team and answered yes to those three supplementary questions um, was around about 40 to 45 percent. And what this means is about 50% of the workforce are working in groups that they refer to as a team, but don't actually have the characteristics of what we expect of a team. These were often referred to as pseudo-teams. And um, what this particular graph is showing you is that when staff are working as pseudo-teams, not only is their engagement level 
so much um, lower than those who are working in what we call well-structured teams, where all three of those questions are answered yes. But it's actually worse than when people aren't working in teams at all. So there's something about working in these groups, which isn't just not a positive, but is potentially actually a negative. <coughs> So one of the real ways in which we can focus our efforts in trying to improve engagement and improve other outcomes is looking at the quality of teamwork. And when I mention other outcomes, um, we've seen in terms of patient mortality that there's a link there. We see that link also when we look at team working directly. Um, uh, I, I'm not going to go into the detail of this, but a paper we looked at, uh, a paper we published the other year, looked at um, the direct link between team working and patient mortality, and surprisingly strong. Patient satisfaction we see as an outcome there. Um, other factors that we know lead into this, as well as team working, are having good quality appraisals, not just a tick box exercise, but actual meetings that are meaningful for staff and for the organisation. Um, supportive leadership, I'll come back to leadership a bit later, um, and again a lack of negative experiences, so that discrimination or um, perceptions of unequal opportunities. These all show link not only with engagement but then also with these other outcomes, patient satisfaction, um, patient mortality and acute trust, but also other outcomes as well, so we see um, particularly within, uh, this going back a few years, we looked at, at uh, a large number of PCTs, we saw links with um, violence, we saw links with errors, we saw links with turnover. Um, and these are things that we have seen um, across different sectors as well. <coughs> so how do we deal with these? How do we make good teams? Um, well, I've already mentioned Sheffield Wednesday this morning. What I would say is don't look at Sheffield Wednesday if you want to know what a good team looks like. Not at the moment, anyway. It pains me to say that. But a good team would have an inspiring vision. This is about having clear, shared objectives for the team. It's not just about the detail of the, those objectives. It's about team members knowing what the team is there for, what it's trying to achieve. But just having a vision isn't enough. It needs the mechanisms in place to help reinforce that. So having regular team meetings, not just for sharing information, for actual discussion. I'll say a bit more about what this would be um, in certain circumstances in a moment, but we need team meetings to be helpful. They do take time. So if they're not helpful, that's going to be a waste of time. Um, but what they should do is enable positive relationships to be fostered so that staff do feel supported. They do know what they're doing and they do have the opportunity to share concerns with colleagues and make sure um, issues that are important don't just fall through the cracks. Um, in doing so, it should help avoid conflict um, because issues can be worked through when they arise. It should engender compassion. By discussing what teams are really there to do and focusing on what's important, which in many cases will be the patients, but also the experiences of the staff, the members of the teams themselves, that um, will help create that same kind of discussion that we, um, we did see when we looked at Schwartz rounds, and I'll say a bit more about that in just a moment. Um, and then there are also uh, a number of other factors. I'm not going to go through all of these in detail um, because I want to highlight the most important ones. Um, but because we're talking about compassionate and inclusive leadership today, um, one of the key things in teams is that they are the ideal situation to foster inclusion. Teams need to value diversity, of course to enable that inclusion. This is something that team leaders need to set the tone for. Research has shown that diversity in teams can be a real positive, but it sometimes can, be, can have negative outcomes as well. 
And what it seems to, what seems to be happening is it where there is uh, a leader of a team who doesn't explicitly value that diversity, doesn't help include team members, that's when um, a lack of cohesion arises, when we see conflict and we see poorer outcomes of those teams. But by having leaders, and this comes right from the top, right through to the most junior leaders in an organisation who value diversity and who promote inclusion, that will foster the conditions which enable teams to thrive. The other thing that's just worth saying a little bit more about is reflexivity. So reflexivity, if you're not familiar with this, is when teams actually take a bit of time out to discuss what they're doing, how they're working, whether they're achieving what they seek to achieve, and if not, how they can improve on that. This is something that research has shown repeatedly produces positive benefits for team effectiveness, for innovation, and for other outcomes as well. It's difficult, especially in the NHS. Um, it's easier for some teams than others. Um, but when you're working on a busy ward in an acute trust, you've got patients constantly dealing with how do you actually get members of the team together to have this kind of discussion. Sometimes it needs some innovative thinking. Sometimes you need to do things in slightly different ways to achieve this. But unless there are these discussions happening somewhere, somehow, teams aren't going to improve in the way that really fosters the, the benefits of those teams. You're not going to get the dividends from working in those teams that, uh, that we should be aiming for. Um, I'm always reminded of a study uh, of a, uh, I forget the precise company, but a Dutch manufacturing company where uh, one kind of management decided that each day they were going to shut down production for the first 15 minutes of the day so that teams could meet. Um, it was met with a lot of surprise and in some cases outrage. 15 minutes production a day, that's a lot of time you're giving up. You're going to lose productivity there. But no, productivity actually increased. Because that discussion that they had in that 15 minutes, not a long period of time, but it can be enough as long as it's well structured, that enabled them to improve, do things better, and actually productivity um, and subsequently profitability went up. <coughs> Obviously the challenges in the NHS are different from that. But with innovative thinking and with good leadership, we can do at least some of that. Now, I mentioned Schwartz Centre rounds earlier because um, these were a way of trying to engender that compassion, not at a team level, but within organisations more generally. Um, and within Schwartz Centre rounds, sorry, within Schwartz Centre rounds, um, they might not be able to uh, seek solutions to everything, that's not what they're there for, but in actually helping staff deal with those pressures that they're under. Um, the idea is that they should be able to help staff work through issues and create less stressful situations for them. Um, so together with a team from King's College London and um, the King's Fund, um, we did a study evaluating Schwartz rounds. And my colleague Imelda McCarthy, uh, we'll just ask Imelda to stand up and um, I worked on this study. Imelda's actually here today uh, because um, she and I are interested in talking to you about some of the other things we're talking about today, in particular um, what your organisations are doing to help uh, improve um, uh, inclusion, equality um, and, and, and work with diversity. So if you have any questions or uh, anything you want to share with us, please do catch one of us later. Um, but. On the, yes, the previous project Imelda works on was looking at the Schwartz Centre Rounds um, and we did a, a lot of different types of evaluation of this. But one of the things we did is look at the extent of stress that staff were under when they, or when they first attended these rounds, compared with eight months later. 
and then compared those with staff who didn't attend rounds at all. And we used uh, a measure some of you may be familiar with called the GHQ12, which measures um, whether or not people are under a sufficient level of stress that they would benefit from some kind of intervention. Typically, levels of this in the NHS are reasonably high, sort of 25 to 30 percent. So um, we do know that it's a stressful environment. What we saw is that amongst people who didn't attend rounds, actually their stress levels were really high to begin with, 37 percent. Eight months later, um, they had shifted not by very much, as you might expect, because there was no intervention there. They'd gone down to 34%, but that was not a statistically significant decrease. If we compare that with people who attended rounds, their starting levels were 25%, so already lower to begin with. But they more than halved. So in other words, went down from 25% of people who attended rounds having high levels of stress before they started attending, to only 12% after eight months. They didn't even need to attend these rounds every month. Some of them did, some of them would have attended um, just two or three. But um, simply by being part of this environment, having that opportunity for discussion, a form of reflexivity, and by enabling them to get in touch with their actual feelings, to be compassionate to themselves, to each other. This actually reduces their stress in a, a clinically validated instrument. So I'm not here today to sell Schwartz rounds to you. That's, um, they're not necessarily the only way of doing this, but they are a way which seems to work. Um, and it's certainly worth considering this or other similar interventions in your organisation to help with those pressures. Now I'm just going to return briefly to these two factors we identified earlier of equal opportunities and discrimination. Because this comes down to the inclusion part of what we're talking about today. And one of the things that uh, we've looked at in recent years is how being from a, a different background from your colleagues affects not only your own working experience, but what it means for patients. And one of the key things we've looked at is a measure called representativeness. So representativeness is about how similar a particular workforce is to either its patient um, characteristics or to its management. So when the um, racial makeup of a workforce matches <coughs> that of its local population, it's said to be representative. If it deviates significantly from that, then it's going to be less representative. Less representative. And what we found is that when organisations are more representative, they are more likely to have patients who rate their uh, care as being more civil. There are fewer uh, incidents that happen, there's le less microaggression, there's, there's, uh, there's a greater um, awareness of people's cultural background and um, any sensitivities that might come with that. Not only do patients rate their care as more civil, but organisations have better outcomes as rated by CQC. Now what this tells us is two things. One is that having organisations that are representative and inclusive of uh, of people from the backgrounds in the areas which they are working uh, is really important. But if that's not the case, then a way of improving outcomes is to really focus on that civility aspect of it. I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. Because the other finding here is about how representative um, the junior members of the workforce are compared with the management 
And this, is, of course, is something that the res looks at, uh, both in terms of very senior managers and those at bands eight and nine. Um, and it's really, it's no coincidence that the res looks at this, because it is so important. If the people who work at the top end of an organisation are not representative of the workforce more widely, it leads to negative outcomes. And in particular, what we see is a higher level of discrimination in trusts where that is the case, particularly from those who are from a minority background themselves. So I know Yvonne's going to talk more about the res in a few minutes, so I'm not going to go into that in any more detail now, but um, this is all based on really solid research evidence. Okay, so how do we actually make this work? How, how do we get from a position of knowing what the um, evidence shows to what we can do in our day-to-day -day work to actually improve this? Well, because we're talking about leadership today, uh, I want to talk about what leaders can do uh, in four different ways. First of all, how leaders can be compassionate. And there are four things that my colleague Michael West in particular has identified as being critical in having compassionate leadership, which will help um, to enable that inclusion, enable um, that compassion. Um, those four things are attending. So in other words, listening carefully to what people say. Listening with fascination. Not just hearing the words and and passing out the things that are most relevant to you, but actually listening to everything that they say. From that, trying to understand what they are going through. Which in turn leads to empathy, empathising, trying to put yourselves in the shoes of that other person. Um, and this is something where uh, I know a lot of organisations have implemented uh, reverse mentoring schemes, that's something which can be really helpful for enabling reasonably senior people to understand and empathise with what uh, their colleagues are going through. And then helping, not just listening and saying, oh yes, that's, that's a shame, uh, but actually then doing something, using your leadership position to do something to help. And it can be little things. It can be um, adjusting a, a work shift to help someone's personal problems, or it can be something really much bigger. And in terms of the bigger things, I'm just going to give you some conclusions now from a, uh, a large study that uh, we did a few years ago, which looked at all sectors of the NHS. Um, we did lots and lots of different aspects of the survey, observation, um, interviews, lots of looking at what boards had done over a period of four years, um, lots of uh, analysis of existing data, gathering new data, um, questionnaire data from teams in 70, 71 different NHS trusts and so on. Between all of these, there were a lot of similarities that the mess of, in the messages that came up. And tried to distill from that um, key messages for leaders in the NHS at three levels. So first of all, going to the lower level of line managers. Now, I say lower level, of course, even those at senior levels are also line managers. But there are over 30% of people working in the NHS who have some kind of line management responsibility. So this applies quite widely. And line managers should make sure that their appraisal meetings are useful and developmental uh, experiences. I mentioned appraisals a bit earlier. Um, one of the most important things there is ensuring that staff have really clear and sensible objectives. Something that's common to all of these findings is the importance of having really good objectives. Not a huge number of them. Usually somewhere between five and seven seems to be a, an appropriate number there, but making sure the staff know what they should be concentrating on, so if they have to make difficult decisions, they can use those as a guide. 
the importance of feedback is really paramount as well. Now, positive feedback can be really beneficial, um, but it's surprising how many people find it difficult to give positive feedback. I don't know why this is. It's something deep within the human psyche, no doubt, um, that it's easier to give negative feedback than it is positive feedback. But actually, you want the positive feedback to outweigh the negative feedback. And of course, that's not to say you shouldn't give negative feedback. Sometimes it's absolutely required. And in fact, in where situations are developing that, that need intervention, you should give the negative feedback in a considered way um, sooner rather than later. But of course, within the NHS as a whole, we know the huge amount of good work that goes on. And yet there are lots of organisations where staff feel they are constantly being told how poorly they are doing. We can remedy that by trying to give positive feedback as often as is appropriate. And, yes, I mentioned the objectives already. These uh, will often be set in appraisal meetings, but not necessarily. But importantly, they should be linked to team and organisational objectives as well. Talking of teams, team leaders very often might be the same people as line managers, but not always. So this is something um, that those who are leading teams need to consider specifically. They need to ensure that the teams have clear objectives. Of all the different factors I mentioned that are important for good quality team working, once we look at them individually, it's the objectives that seems to be the, the most key things. If staff don't know what the team is trying to achieve, how are they going to make sure that their work is fitting into that? But of course, it, people also need to know how they work with other members of the team, how other people's role fits into that. Um, and that needs to be widely known across the team. And then ensuring that there is time for teams to meet. As I said earlier, that's easier for some teams than others. Um, but if some inventive thinking is needed, then use inventive thinking to make sure that there is a way of getting teams to be able to share their experiences, to suggest improvements, um, and where possible to discuss these between themselves. And then act on them. There's no point in having these meetings and then not doing anything. Um, so, so making sure that teams do act on these suggestions is a really important goal of team meetings. But then, looking at the role of boards, um, whether in trusts or senior leaders in uh, other organisations. So, senior leaders need to make sure that the quality of patient care is first and foremost. What we found when we looked at board meeting minutes um, is we, well, we identified a number of organisations who, at the end of our period, were doing well in terms of outcomes and those who were doing more poorly in terms of outcomes. And when we went back three years and analysed the uh, 18 months worth of board meeting minutes for each of those trusts over uh, that 18 month period, Yes, it was as exciting as it sounds. Um, what we found is those trusts who spent more time discussing quality and safety issues were more likely to be those who were doing well. Whereas those who were discussing um, targets, those who were discussing, uh, spending more time discussing finances, were actually those who did less well three years later. Make of that what you will, but uh, I think there's, a, there's certainly a message there about the focus on the right things. Um, promoting staff health and well-being, this isn't about uh, putting on um, particular um, clubs or access to gyms or whatever, that's all good, but it's about making sure that all your staff are, are able to to deal with the pressures that they face, that then the way of work is not making them ill. And sadly, we see too much of that. Um, to listen to staff, this is where we come back to engagement, because that involvement part of engagement is really key 
um, as well as the other parts. So unless staff can make a difference, which needs senior leaders to listen to them, then they're not going to feel engaged. And very often, many of the best innovations come from those staff uh, who are working at the coalface. So we need to make sure there are mechanisms for them to do that. And finally, to seek out uncomfortable information and then act on it. During this study, one chief executive said to us that he gets really, really uncomfortable when all of his board members are saying that everything's fine. Because when you're working in an organisation with several thousand staff, dealing with thousands of patients, it's never going to be the case that everything is fine. So you sometimes have to go looking for that information and then make sure you can act on it, being proactive <coughs> about that. Okay, I'm just going to leave you with um, the, uh, some information about a seminar series which uh, I and some colleagues ran um, a few years ago, um, which involved a large number of speakers, not just from within the NHS, from all sorts of other sectors as well. Um, but we have compiled a lot of uh, material from that seminar series, including not just the, the slides from the uh, particular seminars, but a lot of case studies, a lot of um, summaries of evidence from the literature. And we've put these onto our website, workplaceedi.com. Um, it's just a holding website at the moment. The material's all up there, but it doesn't look great. We're going to be working on that, working on that over the next few weeks. Um, but there is also a discussion forum there, which is a place where you can go and uh, ask questions of others and share your experiences if you want to. Anything to do with equality, diversity and inclusion in the workplace. Okay, I think my hour is up, so thank you very much.